Hi guys, welcome to the fourth episode of the Amazing Inventors Read Aloud series, where we read books about some of the world's greatest inventors and scientists. In our past three episodes, we've read about Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin, and Henry Ford. And today, we're going to be reading a book called Alexander Graham Bell Answers the Call by Marianne Fraser. This book is a great way to learn about Bell's achievements, inventions, and childhood. So let's get into it. Alexander Graham Bell Answers the Call by Marianne Fraser. Here we have some pictures of telephones. From the beginning, the world all around spoke to Alexander Graham Bell, and he listened. His family called him Alec. To his eager ears, the hustle and bustle of 1840s Edinburgh, Scotland was a symphony of every pitch and tone. He even wandered into a field once to see if he could hear the wheat grow. Each new sound whispered to Alec's curiosity. How was he able to hear? What made one noise different from another? Why could he hear some sounds but not others? And a new name. Alec was born Alexander Melville Bell, the same as his father and grandfather. But he adopted his cousin's middle name, Graham, because he liked how it sounded. Alec's father also had lots of questions about sound and hearing. Melville Bell was a speech therapist. The hisses, grunts, and chants of his students spilled from a study where he worked on his visible speech alphabet. The symbols of this al alphabet were different from the English language. They represented every sound made by the human voice. Alec eagerly memorized all 129 of them. While Alec trained his ears to the sounds of speech, his mother heard little of it. Eliza Bell had lost most of her hearing as a child. Still, she was a gifted portrait painter and pianist, filling their home with art and song. To hear notes, she, she would lay an ear tube across the piano's soundboard. Alec had to speak into the same ear tube for his mother to understand him. The awkward device acted like a hearing aid, but a poor one at best. How he wished he could find a better way for his mother to clearly hear his voice, the piano, and the world around them. Antibiotics to the rescue. Before antibiotics became available in 1942, many children lost their hearing to infection and illness. Uh, in time, if they didn't get the proper help, they often forgot how to speak. Along with his brothers, Melly and Ted, Alec learned to play the piano before he could read. Sometimes the music rang in his mind for days. He lay awake at night, puzzling over how instruments produce notes. How were he and his brothers able to hear the notes, but not his mother, who needed the aid of an ear tube? His father explained that sounds are vibrations. Unlike his mother, Alec's ears were able to collect the vibrations and send the information to his brain. Of course, Alec had to test this notion out for himself. Could other parts of his body sense vibrations, too? Uh, how the ear works. This is a diagram of the ear. And you can see small bones, the eardrum, hair cells, the cochlea. The outer ear collects the sound waves. The sound waves cause the eardrum to vibrate. The ear bones transfer the vibrations to the cochlea. Fluid in the cochlea stimulates the hair cells. The hair cells inside the cochlea send electric messages to the brain. In his deepest voice, Alec spoke close to his mother's forehead. By feeling her, his breath and the vibrations of each sound against her skin, she could understand many of his words without the ear tube. His experiment had worked. But at noisy gatherings, his mother still strained to make out what others were saying. There had to be a better way to include her. Alec's answer was to use a two-handed manual alphabet to spell people's words with his fingers into his mother's palm. At last, she could be a part of the conversation. I hear that the Victoria and Albert Museum has opened. I understand it has a refreshment room. We must visit the next time we're in London. <laughs> two-handed communication. The two-handed manual alphabet was not as common as traditional sign language, but it allowed Alec to signal letters on his mother's fingers, knuckles, and palm. For example, a touch to the ring finger is the sign for letter O. While Alec loved to study and experiment with sound, oh, what fun he had showing off with it. 
when friends and uh, relatives visited he pounded the piano keys and belted out songs with ted and melly today uh, together they performed muppet shows and mimicked animals Alex's favorite voice trick was to race about the room as if he was chasing a bee. Buzz. He would then muffle his buzzing after pretending to catch the insect in his hands. For a boy with a head full of questions, it was an exciting time. It was the age of invention, and people everywhere were searching for new ways to solve old problems. Alec was no different. The age of invention. The steam engine of the late 1700s replaced human power with steam power. The rapid growth of factories changed the way people worked. A five-day trip by carriage soon turned into a one-day trip by train, and steamships cut transatlantic crossings from the forty days to twelve. All these changes made the mid-eighteen hundreds a time of great learning and innovation. One day at a flour mill, Alec wondered if he could find a better way to clean the grain. He lined the inside of an old churn with stiff brushes. With each crank, the churn's paddles pushed the grain against the brushes and whisked away the husks. Alec listened to the sweeping noises of his first invention. What else could he invent? So that's pretty cool. A talking machine was the answer. Together, he and his older brother Melly rigged up a rubber tongue, tin tube, and voice box. The downstairs neighbor thought the sound from the boy's contraption was a crying baby. The brothers' talking machine worked like this. Melly's breath blew through the tin plate tube at the back of the talking hand, passing two sheets of rubber that acted like vocal cords. His breath's vibration on the rubber created sound. A resonance chamber similar to a nasal passage then amplified the sound, and at the same time, Alec cranked a lever. Moving the mouth parts, which changed the vibrations into human-like speech sounds. That's even cooler. Alex's noisy pranks didn't stop there. He trained the family ter- uh, family's terrier to growl on command, and then moved its mouth and throat to produce different sounds. To everyone in the room, he sa- uh, it sounded as if the dog was saying, "How are you, Grandma?" Alex's days of pr- Playful experimenting ended when he and his brothers became sick with tuberculosis. Proper medicines for this disease did not were not existed. Only Alex survived. It was a difficult time for the Bells. The family moved to Canada. There, with the loss of Ted and Melly, inspired Alex to do more with his life. He set off for America to make his family proud. In Boston, Massachusetts, Alec became a teacher for the deaf. He taught his students sign language, lip reading, and visual speech. He also invented an alphabet glove. Students pointed to the letters printed on the glove to spell out messages. Each innovation whispered to Alec's curiosity. What more could he do? Alec often wrote to his family about his lessons and ideas, but the letters took weeks, sometimes months, to arrive. The telegraph was much faster, but it was expensive, and it only sent one message in uh, one message in code at a time. The telegraph, uh, in 1837, ten years before Alexander Graham Bell was born, Samuel F. B. Morse invented the electric telegraph. Using short and long pulses of energy, it could send a message in code over a wire. A telegraph operator translated the code into words. It sounds like obsolete right now. But back then it was a huge innovation. There had to be a better way for people to communicate over long distances. Alec was determined to find it, that he would need assistance. At a local machine shop, he met a talented electrician and mechanic, Thomas Watson. Thomas was the perfect person to help him with his experiments. Together, Alec and Thomas began designing a device that could transmit more than one message at a time, each with different vibration patterns or pitch. Oh, sure, they were failures, lots of them, but a childhood spent experimenting with his brothers had taught Alec that the only real failure is to quit. He and Thomas kept at it. Months passed until one day Thomas adjusted a spring on, ja- on a jammed transmitter. From the other room, Alec's keen ears heard a faint twang through the receiver of their multiple telegraph invention. That little sound roared to Alec's curiosity. Instead of transmitting the beep-beeps of dots and dashes, could he transmit the sound of a voice? 
could he design a speaking telegraph? So Alex's transmitter idea worked like this. Sound waves vibrate a thin metal sheet. The coil turns vibrations into electric signals. The electric signals travel along wires, and the coil turns electric signals into a magnetic field. The magnetic field vibrates a thin metal sheet, producing sound waves. Nine months later, Alec finally had a patent protecting his idea. Now all he needed was a working model to prove it. Day after day, each model they tested failed. Finally, Thomas set up a receiver in one room. Alec rigged a liquid transmitter in the separate room. They closed the doors. Alec spoke into the cone, "Mr. Watson, come here. I want you." So the gallows telephone, invented in 1875, was the first of Alex's instruments to transform the sounds of speech into electrical current, but it was not loud enough. A year later, he and Thomas invented a better model. Thomas burst into the hall. "Mr. Bell, I heard you. I heard every word." The speaking telegraph worked. His voice had traveled from a tr- from the transmitter along a wire and to a receiver at the other end. Throughout the rest of the night, Alec and Thomas fiddled with the device until they got it just right. Alec danced a wild jig in celebration. The telephone was born. Ah,、uh, how the telephone works! The telephone acts like an electric mouth. It sends electric current through the electromagnet and causes the receiver's membrane to vibrate, a lot like the membrane of a human ear. The vibrations hit the listener's eardrum, making it vibrate too. The listener's eardrum hears these vibrations as the sounds spoken by the other person at the end. So, what did you guys think? It was a pretty good book, right? If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe, and stay tuned for more amazing inventions read-alouds. Thank you for watching.